Hello there. And so this is video number three of section 6.1. Uh, so we're just going to continue moving forward talking about this new concept of orthogonality. Um, at least the first part of this uh, lecture, we're going to look at some new ideas behind that, which we can talk about. So uh, suppose that W is a subspace of Rn and that I've got a vector Z in Rn, maybe in W, maybe not. So Z doesn't necessarily have to be in W, and oftentimes it won't be in this case. Uh, and suppose Z is orthogonal to every vector in W. And so remember what that means is that the dot product of Z and the dot product of any vector in W is equal to zero. Then we say that Z is orthogonal to W. So if a vector is orthogonal to a set, that means that that vector is orthogonal to every vector in the set. Well, now we can take a set of the vectors that are orthogonal to every vector in a set. The set of all vectors orthogonal to W, where here I've just got a subspace W, is called the orthogonal complement of W, denoted W perp. Uh, w perp. So this upside down T is called perp. Um, as if it kind of, you can see it kind of represents like a perpendicular, two perpendicular lines. So the orthogonal complement to W. And so in this way, W and W perp kind of complement each other in that way that like, um, you know, you can sort of think of them as being like two sides of a coin. So uh, at least the first part of this, I've got these four, um, sorry, three, well, three and a half um, problems that are kind of associated with this definition that I want to go over. Um, all of these, I believe, are very doable, just given these definitions. Uh, so again, I'd highly recommend proving these on your own before watching the proofs in this video. But without further ado, let's get started. Um, so the first thing I want to show is that a vector is in W perp if and only if that vector is orthogonal to every set that spans W. And this is a little more general than we'll need moving forward, but in particular, why we want this statement is that Z is orthogonal to every basis for W. Well, okay, so why is this statement in general true. Suppose that um, I've got a set, say, W1 through WP that spans W. Well, so this statement, and so remember that this statement also implies that Z is orthogonal to every basis for W because every basis for W spans W. I'm gonna erase this just to add a little more space here. Um, so if this set spans W, then for every vector, uh, we'll say V in W, V is equal to C1, W1 plus C2 W C P W P for correctly chosen scalars C1 through C P. Right? Basically what again what it means to span W. Every vector in W can be written as a linear combination of just these P vectors. So what do we want to show? Well, we want to show that just for this arbitrarily chosen vector in W that z is orthogonal to this arbitrarily chosen vector. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the dot product of z and v, but notice this is equal to the dot product of z and this sum. But by the properties of dot products, I can factor z through this sum in the following way. Uh, 
But remember, I've assumed that z is orthogonal to every vector in this set. Um, I guess I haven't put that assumption there, but suppose this set is orthogonal to z, right? Well, this means then that each of these dot products is equal to zero, which means the sum is zero. Also, that means that z dot v is equal to zero. Well, and so now v was an arbitrarily chosen vector in w. And so because z was orthogonal to every vector in a set that spans w, z is actually orthogonal to every vector in w. And so why this statement is extremely important, um, and we will call on this idea quite a bit, is that all we need to do to show that a vector is orthogonal to an entire set is show that a vector is orthogonal to a basis for that set. Um, so the next statement, um, this one I'm actually probably not going to show in the video just to save time. Um, I'll leave this as an exercise for you, but I will post the um, solution or sort of the proof to this in the solutions to the worksheets. Uh, it turns out that if W is a subspace of Rn, then W perp is also a subspace of Rn. So kind of a fun fact that um, if you take a subspace of Rn, then its orthogonal complement is also a subspace of Rn. Um, and you'd show this uh, much in the same way that you show anything's a subspace. You'd you know, sort of check closure under addition. Uh, is the zero vector contained? The zero vector is orthogonal to everything, so the zero vector is contained. Um, and then um, certainly closure, closure under scalar multiplication you could check. It's not, uh, by no means is it the hardest uh, vector space check that I think you would have to do. Um, so yeah, I'll post the, the, the proof for that in the solutions, but uh, just for the sake of time, I'll leave that as an exercise. So now the last one, which I think is the coolest, if we take any M by N matrix A, then the null space of A has orthogonal complement equal to, or the I guess I should say, the null space of A is the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. So that is if U is in null A, then U is orthogonal to row A. So why is this? So this actually turns out to be fairly straight. Like I look at this one, it's just like, whoa, that's so cool. And it's definitely cool. Uh, but this actually turns out to be not that surprising. So if A is an M by N matrix, I'm going to let A equal, I'm actually going to define A by its rows. So we'll say A1 transpose down through AM transpose, where here each of these is a vector of length um, N, but laid on its side. So notice then this set a1 through am is just by definition, well, I guess I should say spans, it's not necessarily a basis, but it spans the row space of A, right? Because just by definition of the row space, it's just the span of the set of rows of A. But also, if you is in the null space of A, 
then a times u is equal to the zero vector. Well, when is that true? If we go back to thinking of a as this collection of rows, and u maybe is this vector of length n, notice that this is equal to the zero vector. So if you think about the matrix multiplication dance in this case, this entry is actually formed by taking the dot product of A1 transpose and U. Well, so that means that the dot product of, sorry, the dot product of A1 and U, right? So this entry here is A1 dot U. And this last entry would be AM dot u. So what I've just shown is that for every row of a, the dot product of that row and of u is equal to zero. But that means that u is orthogonal to a set that spans a, and as we've already seen from problem one in this uh, mini problem set, that means that u is orthogonal to the row space of a. Um, but that means that every vector in the null space of A is orthogonal to the row space of A. And from there, it, we're, we'd ha you'd have to sort of show one more sort of side of this that, right, that like any vector that's orthogonal to the row space of A is in the null space of A, but you would kind of show it in the same way. You can kind of see why, in fact, the null space of A is just the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. Um, and so using a very similar proof to this, you could actually then show that the column space of A, um, its orthogonal complement is actually the null space of A transpose. Um, and basically the proof would go the same way, just using A transpose in the column space of A. So I like that because it's always, it's always fun for me when we get to introduce like a definition like this and somehow relate it back to like a previous thing. Uh, that always, you know, it's always nice to see these somewhat unrelated or seemingly unrelated at first concepts in math relate to each other. So I've got one more quick thing I want to talk about. So I'd mentioned last video we were going to be actually being able to calculate the angles between two vectors. And that's what I want to finish this section with. Um, so this will require a bit of, I think, geometry or trig. Um, the law of cosines, which, if I'm being honest, I think I'd forgotten at one point or another. But anyways, uh, so we're going to let u be the vector 1, 3. And we're going to let v be the vector negative 3, 1. And we're going to let phi be the angle between u and v. So what if we wanted to calculate that angle? How could we do it? Well, notice I've got a triangle here. And we already know the length of this side. And so the law of cosines tells me how I can relate the length of this side, this side, and this side. So by the law of cosines, the following relation must be true. So the length of the uh, side opposite the angle must equal, or squared must equal the length of u squared plus the length of v squared minus two length of u, length of v 
times the cosine of this angle. And so what we can actually do um, is rearrange and expand Um, so this expands to be u dot u minus 2 u dot v plus v dot v is equal to u dot u plus v dot v minus 2 times the norm of u times the norm of v, times the cosine of phi. Well, canceling some like terms on either side, and then dividing by 2. And then dividing by the negative, uh, well, actually, this just gets us, if we divide through by negative 2, that u dot v, it turns out, is equal to the norm of u times the norm of v times the cosine of phi. And so we can then solve for the cosine between the two angles, which is equal to u dot v over norm of u times the norm of v. And so given this, notice given any two vectors, we can always find the angle between those two vectors just knowing their coordinates, right? Take the dot product, divide by the two norms, take the cosine inverse, and we can find the angle. So in this case, if I had the points uh, 1, 3, and negative 3, 1, you can see that the cosine of phi is equal to u dot v, which if you notice u and v are orthogonal, so that's just 0, divided by whatever the norm of u is times whatever the norm of v is. That's just equal to 0. And notice, in fact, everything works out like it should. Um, because the angle between those two vectors is 90 degrees. Um, so as it turns out, actually, somewhat amazingly, we can go at it from the other angle, right, saying, okay, we're going to solve for the angle between those, these two vectors and then, you know, calculate it using dot products and um, norms. And in fact, we get if two vectors are orthogonal, then the angle between them has to be 90 degrees. Uh, so there's a couple more problems on the worksheet, um, which I will leave as exercises. You will, so on the worksheet, um, and I'll post the, the solutions to that as well. Um, uh, there's one where you basically work through the same problem of finding the angle between two vectors, um, but in R3. Um, and then there is one uh, where you get to look at the parallelogram law and, and prove that. But so anyways, uh, this actually wraps up um, section 6.1, and so next we will move into section 6.2.